greet about 10 people around you and just tell them I'm so glad to see you in Jesus' name. Come on, greet about 10 people around you and just tell them I'm so glad to see you. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Come on, greet somebody around you. Hallelujah. Put a smile on your face tonight. Now do me a favor, just clap when you're done, just clap your hands like this. Come on. Everybody clap. Come on, come on, come on. Let's celebrate Jesus tonight. Y'all ready, TPE? Let's go. Sing I will. Come on. Sing oh my soul. And oh that is within me. Gonna bless. Come on, y'all. Bless his holy. Come on, clap your hands like this, everybody. Yes, sir. Let's do it again. Come on. For I will bless the Lord.
you can't break. Yeah, even if I tried. Even if I tried.
Good evening, Abyssinian. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us thank the Lord for the day he has made and let us, second, let us celebrate this revival night. So for let us stand for those who are able to say the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Page number 420 in your hymn book. We all know the song. Let's sing it together. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Let us all stand and sing this together. Verse number one says, How to reach the man of every breath. For an answer, Jesus gave the key.
Good evening, Abyssinia. Brothers and sisters, it is now time to give to God for his, for his goodness towards us. We encourage you to give by texting to 77977 or scan the QR code you see on the screen. I'm expecting by now everybody got your phone out. For in-person worship, for in-person worship, you can scan the QR code that you see on the back of the pew. Or you can use, place your offering in the tithes and offering box in the back of the sanctuary, and you don't have to use an envelope. Our trustees are posted around the sanctuary to assist you in your giving. Now let us pray over the offering. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for giving us jobs, a house, a roof over our head, food on the table, Lord God. The least we can do is just return what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good evening. Good evening. Our scripture this evening comes from Jeremiah 3.15. You'll find it also in your program. It's a very short, pointed verse. I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. The word of God for the people of God. God's word is already blessed. Amen. Amen. everybody doing? Well, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy to do the man that doesn't really need any introduction, Reverend Dr. Rashad Moore. In August 2019, Reverend Dr. Rashad Moore was called to return to his native borough of Brooklyn to serve as the third pastor of the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights. Born and raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Reverend Moore was nurtured in Mount Carmel Baptist Church under the late Reverend Dr. V. Simpson Turner, Sr. He attended the Clara Cartwell School, PS 308, and, and Brooklyn High School of Arts. Pastor Moore earned his, earned his bachelor's degree in philosophy with a minor in religion from Morehouse College a master of divinity, divinity degree in Christian social ethics from New York Union Theological Seminary in 2015 and received his PhD in philosophy and education at Teachers College, Columbia University, 2023. He's a proud member of the Academy of Young Preachers in um, Phi Sigma Tau Philosophical Honor Society. Prior to his call to pastorate, Dr. Moore served as assistant minister and the assistant Baptist at assistant minister, minister at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in the city of New York, and we all know him for certain years, so many years, and under the leadership of the late Reverend Dr. Calvin o Otis Butts III. Among his many clerical and civic duties, Reverend Moore served on the U UNCF, New York Faith Initiative Council, Sheltering Arms Children and Family Service, and the Morehouse Manhattan Alumni Association, and is also a member of Prince Hall Mason's um, Lodge No. 1. Dr. Moore is a passionate preacher, teacher, and scholar who enjoys researching and writing on history and philosophy of American history and education. 
I say like this, um, it's no real to introduce him is, uh, is really, we all know him real well, and I just want to, after the anthem, the next person that will be speaking is our very own Reverend Rashad Dr. Moore.
Let's put our hands together for Jesus tonight. Thank God for the Total Praise Ensemble. We thank God for this hour of worship. To our musicians, God bless you all. To our officers and to our deacons and trustees. It's so good to be home. It's good to be home. It's good to be home. I was sitting there thinking about the years, the years, 11 years ago, I was 22, <laughs> taking the train from Brooklyn, but it's amazing what the Lord has done. Amen. It's amazing what the Lord has done. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks and praise for this moment in time. We thank you, O oh God, for this week of men's services. Thank you, O oh God, that you're not just lifting up our men, but you're lifting up our church, the men and the women, even the children in the back. You remember them. So God, we ask during this moment of preaching that you would bless us with your power and your presence, O oh God that we might be all transformed for the living of these days. This is our prayer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the people of God said, amen, 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 amen. and amen. To Mrs. Butts, we love you to the Butts family. I want to begin by giving a shout out to Deacon Calvin Butts IV, Deacon Herbert Proctor, for a wonderful panel discussion Monday night. Thank God for you both. What a moment. Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to the Old Testament book of Genesis. I know that the theme for the night is Jeremiah, but I'm not going to touch that. I'm going to stay right in Genesis. <laughs> Genesis chapter 22. And if you would permit me just the time to read verses 1 through 19, lengthy, but there's a word in this story. Genesis chapter 22. And I'll be reading tonight from the Good News Translation. And it reads, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He called to him, Abraham. And Abraham answered, yes, here I am. Take your son, God said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, and there on a mountain that I will show you, offer him as a sacrifice to me. Early the next morning, Abraham cut some wood for the sacrifice, loaded his donkey, and took Isaac and two servants with him. 
They started out for the place that God had told them about. And on the third day, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Then he said to the servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there and worship, and then we will come back to you. So Abraham made Isaac carry the wood for the sacrifice. And he himself carried a knife and live coals for starting the fire. And as they walked along together, Isaac spoke up and said, Father, he said, yes, my son. Isaac said, I see that you have the coals and the wood, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham answered, God himself will provide one. And the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place where God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. He tied up his son and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he picked up the knife to kill him. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He answered, yes. He goes right there calling. He answered, yes, here I am. He says, don't hurt the boy or do anything to him. He said, now I know that you honor and obey God because you have not kept back your only son from him. I'm almost done. Abraham looked around. He saw a ram caught in a bush by its horns. He went and got it and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place Jehovah Jireh because the Lord provides. And even today, people say on the Lord's mountain, he provides. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. He says, I make a vow by my own name. The Lord is speaking now that I will richly bless you because you did this and you did not keep back your only son from me. I promise that I will give you as many descendants as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand along the seashore. Your descendants will conquer their enemies. All the nations will ask me to bless them as I have blessed your descendants. All because you obeyed my command. Abraham went back to his servants and they went together to Beersheba where Abraham settled. I want you to hold on to that story. I want to preach tonight during this Men's Week revival from the subject, how are the children? How are the children? The Maasai warriors in Africa have a greeting as they pass one another along the road. There's one simple question, how are the children? The village has long placed the well-being of children as its priority. And even those with no children of their own will give the traditional response, which is all the children are well. There is this understanding that the peace and the safety of the village is determined by the care for the youngest and the most vulnerable in the village. This week, as we remember and celebrate the work of our former pastors as we endeavor to continue to stand tall on the shoulders of great spiritual leaders, I must ask the question, how are the children? And while I know we want to believe that we are standing on the shoulders of great spiritual leaders, the truth is some of us are enjoying the view from their shoulders but far too many of our sons and daughters are not standing. Too many of our sons and daughters are falling into the fires of poverty, of inequality in a city that is becoming increasingly more unaffordable. So the question I have to ask is, how are the children? I was home Monday night for the night of Christian education. Thank God for YouTube. And it was a historic moment. It was a poetic moment. But at the end of the panel discussion, there was something that struck me. And that's when Adam Clayton Powell III said, yeah, we've been talking about our fathers, but he says, but we are also living in troubled times. When he said that we are living in troubled times because high school boys are going to school without pencils and pens. 
He says, they're going to school and they are not taking notes. They are not buying textbooks. They are in class, but they are not learning. He says, and we now, we need leadership that addresses our sons and our daughters. We say that they are unchurched, but they've never been to church. And beloved, that moment reminded me of the episode in the Gospels where Jesus was on the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And Peter had the bright idea that, matter of fact, we should stay up here and we can build altars and monuments to Elijah and to Moses and to Jesus. And then when they got down to the foot of the mountain, there was a father who had brought his son who kept falling into fires and floods and they could not heal him. They wanted to stay on the mountain and worship and honor the fathers, but there were sons at the bottom of the mountain who were falling into fires and into floods. I got one witness in the building. And beloved, and I know we want to believe that we are all standing on the shoulders of great leaders, but beloved, for many of our children right here in this neighborhood, Adam Clayton Power is just nothing but the name of a street. How are the children? And I would, just, I would submit to you tonight that, that the true mark and measure of, of great spiritual leaders is determined by their concern for children. That's what Jesus did. Suffer the little children and bid them not from coming unto me. And then if you do, it's better if you would just take a millstone and just take care of yourself. But... Real spiritual leaders, beloved, take care of children. And you can learn a lot about someone based on how they help those who can't do anything for them. Children don't necessarily have to be those who are 18 and younger. That they're young people that God have put into your life in order to shape them and mold them and, and nurture them. Great spiritual leaders, beloved, implies that there is someone who's following you. There are a whole lot of leaders. There ain't nobody following them. And there are a whole lot of people who think that, 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 that they're leaders, but there's no one following. And I believe that God has blessed us, beloved, as the Abyssinian Baptist Church with a legacy of pastors and leaders who have given us the blueprint, not just on how to be successful. I still can't believe T.D. Jakes took money from Wells Fargo. <laughs> Not just to be successful, but they gave us the blueprint on how to live with integrity, how to educate our children, how to rebuild our community, how to love our people, how to organize black folk, how to maintain property, how to keep a prayer life, how to bring the gospel to life for a world that is hungry for living bread. And the question must be, remain, what will it take, beloved, now for us to save our children? That leads us right now into our text for tonight, Genesis 22, which is by far one of the most heart-wrenching texts in the Bible. It tells the story of a young man whose life almost ended when his father was commanded by God to offer him as a burnt offering. And you know the story of the binding of Isaac. Abraham woke up one morning and got ready for his mission. And as they were walking up to Mount Moriah, Isaac gets this funny feeling in his stomach because he knows that something is missing. He had that Keith Sweat spirit. Something, something just ain't right. And, and he says, Father, I see the supplies, but, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham reassures Isaac that God would provide a lamb, but when they get to the top of the mountain, Abraham takes out the wood and he lays it down and he binds Isaac across the altar and he lifts up the knife to take his son's life. And just in the nick of time, 
God dispatched an angel to stop Abraham from sacrificing his son. In that moment, Abraham comes to know God as Jehovah Jireh. Beloved, this text tells us that Abraham is rewarded with all kinds of blessings because of his obedience, even if it cost him his beloved son. Abraham made his way back down from Mount Moriah with two servants, and they went to Beersheba where Abraham settled. Somebody's asking this tonight, what is the relevance of this for men's week? Beloved, preachers and teachers across the centuries have done a great job of celebrating Abraham for his faith and his willingness to sacrifice his son in obedience to God. Even the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said that he praised Abraham for, for suspending his ethical responsibility in order to step out on faith. But beloved, while we celebrate Abraham for his faith, the truth is he was a terrible father. Abraham is celebrated for his faith, but when it came time to caring for the well-being of his children, he was terrible. He never spoke up when Sarah put Hagar in the wilderness and kicked out Ishmael. When it came to sacrificing his son, he said nothing. This is the same Abraham who spoke up for the whole city of Sodom. But when it came time for his own son, he never said a mumbling word. And beloved, the title of the story is The Binding of Isaac, the Ikeda. But the tragedy of the story is that it's all about Abraham. Abraham's award-winning faith is demonstrated on the back of his son's trauma. Isaac's trauma becomes the impetus for Abraham's blessings and promises. And family, we cannot let our adoration of the father's faith make us ignore the children's issues. And if we're not careful, we often give religious exemptions to bad behavior. That's why during a whole global pandemic, one community was allowed to keep their schools open because we give religious exemptions sometimes to bad behavior. And I know that we sing about the blessings of Abraham, his numerous descendants, his victory over his enemies, his global recognition, but it was Isaac who was on the altar with a knife in his face. Abraham left blessed but it was Isaac who left traumatized. Abraham was not alone on the mountain, y'all. Isaac was there too. And despite the praise of Abraham as the father of the faith, it was Isaac whose actual life was on the line. And if it is anything that we can learn from this text is that we don't just learn about the God of Abraham. We also learn about the God of Isaac. And, and the question is tonight for us is, 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 what is it going to take for us to unbind Isaac? I, we don't talk about children enough. How do we unbind Isaac and save all of our sons and our daughters? I got three things, and I'm going back to Brooklyn. Y'all mad quiet tonight, but I'm going back to Brooklyn. Good to see you. First thing is, you got to let go. You got to let go. One of the reasons why I have wrestled with this text is because so many people believe that Abraham picking up the knife was a sign of his faith. We live, beloved, in a nation where we're obsessed with guns, we, obs we are obsessed with violence, we are obsessed with militarism, and I know that it is easier for people to pick up a knife 
and pick up guns and it's harder to put them down. It's easier for politicians to stand by gun rights instead of human rights. And Abraham, beloved, his faith wasn't marked by picking up a gun, but his real faith was in the fact that he was willing to let it go. It was one philosopher who said that, you know, oftentimes we shout about the fact that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. He says, but it is amazing to me that in spite of all that was going on in that moment, Abraham was able to hear the angel's voice. And beloved, that's what being with God is like sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you got a plan and then God comes and disrupts that plan. I mean, Abraham walked three days to get to the top of the mountain. Then he had to walk up the mountain. And at the moment when he gets ready to take his son's life, the angel says, don't harm him. You know, I, I, I shout to that because I know some of us, if that was us on that mountain, we would have had our minds already set. I came too far. I bought all this wood, I came all this way. You know, I don't like when people change plans at the last minute. My mind is already made up. You see all this wood I bought? You see how far I had to walk? And beloved, that's how God is. You know, oftentimes God will tell you one thing and then by the next week, God will tell you something else. Coincidences. And, and that's, that's what, and, and, and faith, beloved, is a journey of a thousand letting goes. It's, it's, you're always going to have to let go of something. The disciples had to let go of their, uh, their nets by the river. Every now and again, God calls us to let something go. And in that moment, Abraham has to let go of his plan in order to save his son's life. And beloved, I'm all about Sankofa. But I just don't think that everything in our past is worth digging up. I'm all about the Sankofa. But there are some things in the past we just need to let go. Just let it go. I heard a voice from heaven say unto me, Right, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do fire. Ashes to ashes. Something you just got to let it go. That's what faith is all about. Letting go and believing that if I let this go, God's got something better for me on the other side. I wish I had one witness. And, and, and the second thing is, and I want you to listen to me now. This, you know, I'm not really a revival preacher. I just got to turn on through here. But the second thing is, when it comes time to unbinding Isaac, because I don't think the altar is any place for any child. The altar is not a place of sacrifice for any child. I don't care who they are. I don't care how different they are. Okay, let me move this. And, some, and, and, and I know somebody's going to say, but Reverend, that's what the Bible says. And you've got to remember, there are some folk who are so much hung strung on the idea of the sacrifice that they don't even understand that the faith was not in the sacrifice, the faith was in the obedience to follow the angel the second time. As grandma would say, obedience is better than sacrifice. Second point, and I'm moving on. I believe that this text also shows us, y'all, that even in this work of saving our children, we have got to slow down. We have got to slow down. From the moment Abraham gets the assignment to the moment he lifts the knife, nowhere in this passage does it say that he ever prayed. Somebody's saying, but it's obvious that he prayed because he was a man of faith. And I have been in church long enough to know that ministry does not just equate to a devotional life. And for those of us who are in the work of ministry, oftentimes we can think that being busy in church substitutes for the time we ought to spend in prayer. I mean, he 
wakes up early, he saddles a donkey, he gets the servants, he gets his son, he cuts the wood, he grabs the coals, he sharpens the knife, he sets out for Mount Moriah, he walks up Mount Moriah. All of the things that he has to do in order to please God while dealing with his own physical exhaustion, while dealing with his own emotional trauma, his own anticipated grief, his own confusion, his own uncertainty, his own isolation, his own fear, he has to do all of this and he never slows down. And so you wonder why I act up when we get to church. Because I never slow down. I never slow down. Working on the assignment, beloved, sometimes will distract us from the time we ought to spend. You know, I think spirituality is like, anybody from Texas? It's like making that, letting that, that meat smoke. Is that what it is? 24 hours. It's like baking that cake. You know, I used to always wonder why my grandmama would leave the butter out right next to the microwave. You could just throw the butter in the microwave and let it melt if that's what you wanted to do. But they said if you do that, it breaks up the consistency and it might be convenient, but it won't be the same. And you can't expect to have a prayer life if you don't put no time into it. You got to tarry before the Lord. And sometimes we move so fast in ministry that we don't even realize what we're doing. We don't even realize what we're saying. I will cuss you out. in a ministry meeting because I never stopped to think about what's really happening here. Abraham never stopped to realize what he was about to do. If I have wounded any soul today, if I have caused any foot to go astray, if I have walked in my unwillful way, Lord, just forgive. You know, sometimes I realize that sometimes ministry becomes my distraction from my devotional life. I know that's not going to make you shout, but it'll keep us together. If I could just take a little bit more time in my prayer life to just make sure that I got some gas in my tank, that my heart is tuned for worship, that, I, that, that God is really in this. Okay, then I'm done. The last point I got then, Listen to Isaac. That's my last point. You got to listen to Isaac. The market measure of our faith, beloved, is not just in what we believe, but the courage to speak up when it's more convenient to keep silent. It's the courage to speak up when it's more convenient to keep silent. And faith, beloved, is not just what we believe, it's how we act. And it's not just about following rituals and reciting prayers, but it's about speaking truth to power, but also sometimes being empowered to listen when it comes. Isaac questioned his father Abraham, even when it was easier for him to keep quiet. And beloved, we do ourselves a disservice when we think that Abraham was the only leader on the mountain. He wasn't the only leader. Isaac was a leader too. Sometimes leaders are younger than us. And what the older generation won't address, a younger generation will. We love to celebrate Abraham, but, but we often forget that Abraham was once Isaac too. Somebody said to me, well, when I was applying to a church, they said, well, he's only 29. What can he teach me? I said, Jesus was dead by 33. I mean, how much time do you want me to have? <laughs> then I learned that even here, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was 29 when he became the pastor. 
And it wasn't because he was an exceptional, but because he had the experience of walking with the giant who showed him the way. And the question for us is, in the midst of all of this, are you being a good ancestor? Because one day people will remember you for what you did today. Listen to Isaac. And, and, and beloved, every question, this is, this is it now, every question is not a critique. He said, Father, he says, I see the supplies. Where's the sacrifice? I see it. And, and, and we get upset because he said it. But, and, and the thing about it is, is, as black folk, we have been taught how to keep our questions to ourselves. That's why, we be, that's why we're quiet in the doctor's office. You know, we just give me what you're going to give me. So wait a minute, these two medications don't go right, right? We have been taught to keep our mouths shut in order to keep safety, but, but Isaac has a voice. I'm done. But even though Abraham had his own hangups, I'm so glad that God was also on the mountain. God was looking out for Isaac. And God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. I'm so grateful that God not only dispatched an angel just in the nick of time, but God even went ahead of Abraham and went to the spot and placed a ram in the bush just to provide another way out because he is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Lord who provides. That's a, a shout right there. That I don't know what it is that you're going through and I don't know what, but what had you up last night, but there's some good news in knowing that God has already gone ahead of us to give us the ram in the bush. You know, we got this, Sister Renita, we got this way of thinking that God is always behind us. Oh God, our help in ages past, but he's also the hope for years to come. God has already gone ahead of us. But what I love about this text, and I'm really done after this, but what I really love about this text is that it reminds me that we're celebrating Men's Day and we're celebrating this Men's Week because God is the God of Abraham. God is the God of Isaac. I'm not going to even get to Jacob, but Abraham and Isaac. I grew up in a church where every Sunday the deacon, old deacon Gilchrist, Anderson Gilchrist, opened the service up the same way every Sunday. Let us pray, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I never understood why we got to pray to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But beloved, what I realize now when I'm starting to understand is that when they prayed to the God of Abraham and Isaac, they understood that God was big enough to hold two generations at the same time. God is expansive enough. God is gracious enough. God is merciful enough to hold two of us at the same time. He can be God for my grandpa and be God for my little brother at the same time. He could be God for Leroy and Laquan at the same time. He could be the God of Shirley and Shaquasia at the same time. There's enough God for the both of us. And I don't got to be like my grandpa in order to understand who God is. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac. He is the God of Abraham who stopped him and the same God who allowed Isaac to speak. It's the God who guided Abraham's steps but also cleared Isaac's doubt. It's the God who gave Abraham hope but he also lit up Isaac's questions. He is the God who tested Abraham but he also strengthened Isaac's heart. He is the God who promised Abraham the stars, but he also shows Isaac the way. He is the God who listened to Abraham's prayers, but he also heard Isaac's whispers. He is the God who changed Abraham's name and gave Isaac his own voice. He is the God of Abraham, the father who taught Isaac to stand tall. He is the God of Abraham, the God who blessed his journey, but also he is the God who walked with Isaac. He is the God who saw Abraham's tears, but he also caught Isaac's tears as well. It's the God who gave Abraham dreams, but also ignited Isaac's 
curiosity. It's the God who stood by Abraham, but he also had Isaac's back. It's the God who honored Abraham's faith, but he also honored Isaac's question. He is the God who stood by Abraham in trials, but he also admired Isaac's courage. It's the God who heard Abraham's prayers, but he also respected Isaac's protests. And for this God is our God and shall be our God forever and ever. Two generations, but the same faithful God, the same God who is holding our ancestors is the same God who is holding us. The same God who led our mothers and our fathers is the same God who will hold our sons and our daughters. The God who walked with Adam Sr., is the same God who walked with Adam Jr. The same God who walked with Sam Proctor is the same God who walked with Calvin Butts. And the same God who walked with them is the same God who will walk with through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Abyssinian, did you enjoy that for Reverend Rashad Raymond Moore? Give it up again. We are so happy to have him home and have him give us a very spirited revival this evening on this Wednesday midweek. You know, can be hump day, but that's a good word that get us over the hump. So we are very happy that he came here tonight. And if you enjoy tonight, you know. If you enjoyed tonight, and if you enjoyed Monday, our night of Christian education, we really ask that you return on Monday to come worship with us at our 71st annual Men's Day, where we will have a guest speaker by the name of Dr. Eddie S. Glaude Jr. You may have heard of him. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Princeton, and I'm sure he's going to give us a great word that touches on the intersection of the African-American community and religion. So come on out and, and get filled up. So as I usually do each year, I, I like to give out some key points from our revivalists. So just bear with me really quickly. Uh, Reverend Moore gave a really great point, about three of them. Um, his first one talked about how Abyssinian's leaders have left us the blueprint to several things but there are five that I took down. They gave us the blueprint to educate our people, rebuild our community, love our people, organize our people, and maintain property. Another point that I remember is fathers must speak up. Um, just give you a little anecdote. Watch over your children in schools, whether public or independent. There are certain practices that are being taught that might be inconsistent. You have to respectfully speak up and stand firm and protect your children. I had to do it today and last week. Let it be known. And then there are three more things that he left us with that were really connected to his word tonight. One, you have to let go. The journey of faith is a journey of a thousand let goes. That was pretty good. Second, we must slow down. As a lawyer, sometimes I could read the statute or the regulation and get back to the client too quickly. So without really looking at a key point, so I've learned to slow down by just writing down my interpretation and then giving it. So slow down, you might miss something or catch something if you do slow down. Third, listen to Isaac. I interpret that as listen to your children. They have voices too, right? If you teach them right, they'll speak up and do right. So with that, we enjoyed ourselves with Reverend Moore and we ask that you come on out again on Sunday. And Before I let go, we ask that Brother Unwache come up, and we're going to make sure that we present. Beloved, we never want to end the service without opening the doors of the church. 
There may be one under the preaching of the gospel, through the singing of the choir tonight, whose heart has been moved. You may have come in tonight, you've never said yes to God before. You may not be a part of a fellowship. Maybe you recently moved to New York and you need a church home where you can connect, where you can grow, where you can serve. The doors of the Abyssinian Baptist Church are open. There may be one, you can now come walk down the aisle, receive the hand of one of our deacons. We would love to walk with you, to journey with you on this road to Zion. Can we stand tonight? Can we join our voices in song one more time? Six twenty. Join in a song of sweet accord. Join in a song of sweet accord. Thus and thus. Sing that chorus one more time. We're marching. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching up to Zion. One more time. Come on, put your hands together. Come on. so thankful that everyone has come this far during this men's week and we're just grateful for the good word of Reverend Moore before we close out this evening we just have some very special words that we're going to speak to him as we recognize him with an award brother Deezer take it away good evening Abyssinian good evening before I get to say a few words, thank you so much, Chair. Before I say a few words uh, to Dr. Moore, I must say to my heart to walk in Deacon and Wache and to Brother Timothy Nash, Esquire, you two are some of the most remarkable young men, and I really thank you. You're a great leading man. And, and I say that because God is so good that sometimes through my struggle, I can call these two young men and they are just my rock. So I just want to say thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. This crystal is presented to Reverend Dr. Richard Raymond Moore, First Baptist Church of Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York. And it's in recognition of your distinguished leadership, your tireless commitment and dedication to the ministry. Your dedication as an educational and spiritual leader is deserved and well chronicled. It is truly an honor to recognize an outstanding man who continues to enhance the social and uh, excuse me, educational equality throughout the nation. Through your tireless efforts, you continue to inspire, as you just said in your word, the next generation of leaders, our children. You are truly a beloved son of the Abyssinian Baptist Church. The men's ministry and the entire church community appreciate your exemplary leadership and advocacy throughout the nation. You continue to be a beacon of hope to both the church and community. Words cannot eloquently express our appreciation for your dedicated service. We thank you for your powerful spiritual message inspiring words emanating from your tireless sacrifice with our respect and appreciation the Abyssinian Baptist Church community the men's ministry we thank you God bless you
Simeon. What a wonderful, wonderful revival we had this evening. We thank you all in the sanctuary and all online for sharing this space and time with us. Of course, we thank Reverend Rashad Raymond Moore for his wonderful, wonderful revivalist message. Let us give him some more thanks and praise. Thank you to our wonderful musicians, the Total Praise Ensemble. And of course, thank you to this awesome men's ministry for such a marvelous event. As we prepare to depart from this space, we wish you a safe trip home, and we hope you will join us on Sunday for Abyssinian's 71st Annual Men's Day as we welcome Dr. Eddie Gloud, Jr. So now let us pray. Now may the power of God, the love of Christ Jesus, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us, now henceforth and forevermore, world without end. Amen. Men's Week of Services take place at Abyssinian. This year we observe Men's Week with the theme standing on the shoulders of our great spiritual leaders. We will celebrate the 71st annual Men's Day on Sunday, October the 8th at 10 a.m. with keynote speaker Dr. Eddie Glaude of Princeton University.